Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us as we kick off the very first PSC Partners webinar, PSC IBD and COVID-19 Coronavirus, What You Want to Know. In this time of challenging uncertainty, we feel that facilitating the exchange of solid and reliable PSC specialist information is one way PSC Partners can support the PSC community. On this webinar, we currently have with us our three medical panelists, our two moderators, and it looks like about 150 attendees. Welcome. My name is Mary Diaz, and I am the president of PSC Partners Seeking a Cure Canada. I'm gonna tell you what we plan for the next hour, and then I will hand the mic off to Ricky to introduce our speakers. We will start with presentations from our three panelists, and then we plan for 30 minutes after the presentations for Q&A. You will have a chance after the presentations to ask your questions. Please hold your questions until that time. After the presentations, I will give instructions to you on how to use Zoom to submit a question. We currently can't see or hear you. I hope you can see and hear us. If you are having any problems, please try to use the chat box and one of us will try to help you sort it out. You can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen. You may have to move your mouse and have the pointer hover over the bottom of the Zoom window to see the chat icon. Please do not put your questions for the panelists into the chat box, they won't be seen there. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to turn over the microphone to the CEO and founder of PSC Partners Seeking a Cure, Ricky Safer, who will introduce our panelists and kick off the meeting. Thank you, Mary. I'm Ricky Safer, founder and CEO of PSC Partners Seeking a Cure and a PSC IBD patient. I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us tonight for our COVID-19 webinar. I hope that everyone in our PSC community is taking social distancing seriously. I know that you're all going stir crazy at home, feeling extremely isolated and stressed with the additional unpredictability in our lives due to the coronavirus outbreak. Last weekend when Dr. Gideon Hirschfield suggested doing a webinar to update our PSC community on the coronavirus situation, we jumped at the chance. As Mary said, for tonight's agenda, our three expert presenters will each speak from their personal perspective for five to 10 minutes about what we know and don't know about COVID-19, misconceptions about the virus, reliable sources for us to access accurate information, why a new vaccine takes us so long to go to market and other pertinent issues for our community. After their presentations, we will open up the Q&A discussion. We will try to answer as many questions as possible but unfortunately, due to the high volume of excellent questions and our one hour session, we probably won't be able to get through all the questions. We will do our best. Please only submit questions that apply to others in the PSC community as well, not questions for you personally. This is our first webinar, webinar ever, as Mary said, and we are still learning the ins and outs of the technology involved. If we run into a glitch tonight, please bear with us. Also, we know that currently there's an overload on video conferencing sites. So if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, remember that we are recording today's webinar. When the recording is ready, we will post it on our website, our social media sites, and on YouTube. So I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Gideon Hirschfield, who's a hepatologist at the Toronto Center for Liver Disease and director of the Autoimmune Liver Disease Program. Dr. Hirschfield is a member of our Scientific Medical Advisory Committee, and he's been passionate for years about finding new therapies and a cure for PSC. Dr. Hirschfield? So um, good evening, everyone. And if, I think, first of all, a huge uh, thank you to, to Ricky, Mary, and everyone else at PSC Partners, because um, they've put an enormous amount of work to actually get this to uh, go ahead tonight. And really, you know, uh, I think that in, its, in itself is just very important for the community. So, um, as Ricky said, I'm, I'm a liver doctor. I, I'm not a virologist. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I am a practicing clinician, um, as are uh, my co-speakers tonight, um, with a lot of experience. And we thought that it would help to just talk about the virus and talk about what that might mean for our patients with PSC, our patients who had a liver transplant, and some of our patients who might currently be taking part in clinical trials. I think the first thing to say is these are unprecedented times. They're not unpredicted times, but they're unprecedented in, in, in our generation. And they reflect the connected community that we now 
call home, which is a global world where people move and bugs move. And so it's a reality that we have to live with. It's reality that we can live with. And it's something that we're going to just have to make adjustments to. Just like living with the uncertainty of PSC, which many of our patients um, really cope with incredibly well, and most patients cope with it incredibly well. So this is an, another challenge to add to your list. I think, you know, as I said, I'm not, not a virologist, but what I have gleaned about coronavirus, I think, is really that this is a virus that is readily spread. This is a virus that is part of a family of viruses that cause colds, that cause pneumonias. But this particular strain of virus has not been seen by humans before. And what that means is that we don't have any immunity to it. And Ricky mentioned vaccines. There is no vaccine yet for coronavirus. There will be a vaccine for coronavirus. But vaccine development takes a year to 18 months and as much time to then roll out. What that means is that when we first see the virus, it's the first time for our immune system to interact. And that's why the majority of us who get exposed to this virus will get some kind of illness. However, it's important to recognize that actually, even if two thirds of the world get this virus eventually, the overwhelming majority of patients will be completely fine. We will, the majority of us will not um, uh, have any significant consequences from the virus. A large proportion of us may even have such a mild illness we can't even detect it. However, that is not true for everybody. And it is not true particularly for people we think who are of older age. And we think the cutoff is somewhere around 65 to 70 years of age. Where, as I'm sure you've seen from TV and news um, sources, they can be particularly prone because of other illnesses, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, smoking, um, to get the consequences of a viral pneumonia and the secondary inflammation and secondary infections. And really the challenge that we're facing is less that doctors know how to look after patients with viral pneumonia. We look after those patients every year when that happens between causes like influenza and other viruses. But doctors can only look after a certain capacity of patients on one day. There's only so much resource within the system that one of the challenges that the system will face is a demand challenge. So the medical community is probably more focused on how to manage the demand in addition to the focus that's going on for new treatments, which are being actually studied already for coronavirus and for vaccines for which um, there's a lot of uh, effort uh, being undertaken. And that's why we've all learned a new term called social distancing um, and reducing the spread, reducing the peak. I think we'll hear later on probably a better term is physical distancing because at this time, the last thing we really want is to socially distance ourselves from our friends and family because we're all going to need quite a lot of support. But what we don't need to be is in each other's companies quite as much as we have been. And we don't need to necessarily be traveling as much, which is why there's been such significant impact on, on travel. Because if we can successfully slow the spread of the disease and change the pace, then the uh, impact to society, to countries, can be very different. It's inevitable that we will compare ourselves to other countries for where there's coronavirus outbreaks, and that will be something that's driving a lot of the anxiety. But I would just caution people to say that actually the experience of coronavirus is different in lots of countries. There are, of course, very disturbing stories coming out of Italy, Spain, but there are also reassuring stories coming out of South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, where there have been very successful efforts to, to contain this virus. So that really sort of summarizes what I understand about this virus, which is very common, which is a virus which is spread in the same way as other respiratory viruses, largely by droplets, not by aerosols. 
which means that largely masks are effective in, in hospital practice. And it is largely, but not exclusively, and we can, we'll no doubt talk about colonoscopy, largely going to be spread, we think, by, you know, from people's uh, mouths and when they cough and when they sneeze. Then really I should just touch upon, and Ricky's watching the clock for me very closely, so she'll tell me if I'm saying too much, what it means really if you're living with PSC, if you've had a transplant, or if you're in the middle of a clinical trial for a new drug for PSC. So the first thing I'd like to say is that actually we don't think you're more likely to get this virus. That is not um, a risk factor that you should worry about. Um, we do think, however, and it's my opinion, I think it's the other opinion of, of most people now, that you should practice physical or social distancing and you should take it seriously. Um, where I live in Ontario, we have now shut down. We are canceling elective work in our hospitals. Our schools are all closed. People are not able to go to restaurants and they're encouraged only to go shopping and go for a walk and to avoid um, gatherings. Churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, temples are not holding services. Um, I think similar things are happening slowly across America and clearly happening in other parts of the world. So we do encourage you to take that seriously because the best approach is to not all get this at once and to avoid getting it at all. Hand washing, social distancing are all, all key things. And then if you're sick, it's treating it with some dignity and some respect for your um, people outside of your family. And that's where self-isolation for up to two weeks has become something that's, that, 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 is, that is normal. But broadly speaking, for our PSE patients, um, our concern is therefore not the fact that they've got PSE. Some of our PSE patients will be on medicines, and, and Josh will talk about some of those medicines from the IBD perspective, but some of them will be on medicines that might suppress the immune system because there's concern around autoimmune hepatitis. They may have had liver transplants. I'd like to reassure you that actually what we've learned from our clinical colleagues in Italy, that is they haven't actually seen more patients with chronic liver disease getting coronavirus, but it's early days, but that is reassuring. We are considering anyone who has cirrhosis and who's immunocompromised, or in essence would have been re recommended to have an influenza shot to be at greater risk, but that's from the abundance of caution. That is not from data that suggests that if a patient who's uh, in that situation, will, they will um, definitely do worse. It does seem that for the majority, the largest risk factors, and this is not to say that young people cannot get sick, um, those of you who follow Twitter will know that one of our transplant surgeons posted a, a Twitter about his sister living in Madrid, who, you know, who's young. But actually, the majority of people who get significant disease, it, the, the concern will be around age. And that's why we're really encouraging our community to look after those people and to encourage those people over the age of 65 to 70 to really be even better at the social distancing. We are not keen that you stop your medicines. Now is not the time to get sick. Now is the time to stay away from doctors. Now is the time to be in touch with your doctor virtually. Now is not the time to go to ER unless you're breathless. You are better off doing everything by phone and electronically and allowing the system to cope with potential increases in demand and not putting yourself at risk or the staff at risk by acquiring the virus because you go to, to hospital. So indeed, in our hospital system, um, coronavirus testing is not being done in hospitals. It is being done at centers away from hospitals, which of course makes sense. The majority of patients do not need to go to hospital. We believe you should stay on your medicines. We believe that you should contact your clinician if you do get a fever and they will give you individual advice. But we really do not want you to make adjustments that would make you sick and would increase the potential that you required um, attention from healthcare that might, uh, in the weeks ahead, um, become under strain. And then I guess the last thing I'll just touch upon before handing over to Josh, and of course there's plenty of time for questions, is those patients on clinical trials. First of all, I can reassure you that the clinical trial companies are taking this very seriously. 
the investigators are taking it very seriously and they're doing everything they can to convert the visits that were scheduled into virtual visits, blood draws at home, and really to continue the study safely. It is quite likely that you won't start a new trial uh, at present, so we won't recruit new patients for, some, for a good few weeks until things are clearer. We've put a hold on that. But the patients who are on study drugs should not worry. They will continue to be looked after. And wherever possible, we will switch their safety visits and their visits to supply their drugs to other ways, blood draws at home, delivery of drugs by taxi. But there may be some short-term disruption just while we get the structure for that in place. But again, I'm sure Josh will touch on that. Most research institutes are taking this very seriously. Most universities have closed. Um, so that there is the time and attention to those patients, small number of patients who are actively partaking in, in study drugs. Again, we'd encourage you not to make any changes to your treatment um, and to be in touch with your investigator and their nurse or coordinator to ensure that you have got the latest advice. So I guess that sort of covers at a high level some of my thoughts. Um, it is a anxious time. Um, however, we should talk about our anxieties and I think we'll talk about that later on. And if we do all support each other and essentially are sensible, I'm quite sure that we can traverse this um, and uh, go back to a sense of normality uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirschfield, for all that practical advice and your positive spin on this. We really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Dr. Joshua Korzenek, a gastroenterologist who is the director of the Resnick Family Research Center for PSC and director of the Crohn's and Colitis Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He is involved in clinical care of people with these diseases. His research is focused on developing new therapies for PSC based on a better understanding of PSC and IBD. Dr. Korsnick joined our Scientific Medical Advisory Committee this year. Dr. Korsnick? Wonderful. Thank you. I'm delighted to be part of this. Thank you, all the, the organizers. It's really an impressive effort in a very short period of time, and it's really very moving to see that I think there are over 200 uh, people who are listening. And thank you, Gideon, for really an excellent uh, introduction to what's going on. I think that it's a very difficult time. It's difficult because we're making many major decisions based on completely inadequate information. And so we're sort of changing things day by day and trying to understand more how to give people adequate advice and take care of themselves uh, as well as possible. Um, I think that the very first thing to understand is that it's slightly different in terms of from the inflammatory bowel disease side. And I've sort of I've uh, been living my life as a doctor in the GI tract and have, have slowly made my way up to the liver and I'm delighted to be able to sort of shake hands through the common bile duct there. Uh, and I think it's really a partnership, uh, but we use lots of other medications which unfortunately are not effective in PSE, but have certain potential implications for uh, the potential risk of, uh, of corona. So even just to understand what corona does to the body, I think that the very first thing is, as an example of what we're changing or learning day by day, <coughs> excuse me, in the initial uh, reports out of China, it was only about 4% of people had uh, diarrhea, had GI symptoms. Uh, we're now learning that in uh, a non-hospitalized cohort or in people who do then get hospitalized, it's probably much, it can be much more than that. It might be as much as 45%. Uh, and sometimes uh, people will present uh, with nausea and vomiting. If that's less common, that can be a little bit more in kids. We're really, these are various uh, series of patients. Uh, and so they're very nonspecific signs and symptoms. So don't be worried that if you have uh, a little bit of GI distress, that that means that you've got uh, corona. I think we're all probably convincing ourselves at some point during the day that we have uh, corona. Um, I think that the, the critical issue that we confront in inflammatory bowel disease in the care of people with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's is what should we make any adjustments to any of the medications? And the short uh, line is 
that uh, we don't. But having said that, I want to sort of refine some of those uh, assessments. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the first issue is that inflammatory bowel disease itself does not increase the risk of developing corona. It's the medications that might. When we look at the various medications, uh, some of them, such as mesalamine, so those are the ones that go under the names of Lialda, Azacol, Aprizo, uh, other things, along that, Rowasa and Canasa, they're not immune suppressants. They're used more in ulcerative colitis. They can be quite effective. And those, don't, uh, those are things that we're not worried about uh, at all. Uh, there are others then that we are worried about because they are immune suppressants. Um, and again, we'll go through them, uh, but the, the standard approach is that we're trying to weigh two different things. We're weighing the risk of a flare, uh, and it's not just a flare. We worry about needing then possibly prednisone, needing potentially hospitalization, not because of corona, but just because of the flare. And that we feel is probably a greater risk um, in itself, and then it could potentially expose you more to, to COVID-19. So as Gideon had, had said, this is not a time uh, to be in a doctor's office or in a hospital, uh, so we really want to avoid that. When we look at uh, some of the other medications, when we think about things like uh, anti-TNF uh, agents, so Remicade, Humira, uh, Adalimumab, and Fliximab, uh, Simzia, Sertilizumab, or Symphony, uh, we uh, are concerned about those as immune suppressants. We don't know really much at all about what their interaction is with corona, but we are very much assuming they're immune suppressants and it potentially could lead to a worsening course. When we look across the board at people who are on them, we do worry about certain viruses such as hepatitis B, but for the most part, uh, people who say get the flu on those uh, don't seem to have a much worse course. Um, and uh, we still would worry about it if you're due for your uh, Remicade dose or Humira dose, we would say maybe it's not the time to take it until your fever's gone. But for the most part, uh, almost universally, people get through that particular infection and do very well without any troubles. Uh, so we don't want anyone to stop that. And what's the risk of stopping? Not only a flare, but particularly for these uh, biologics or these monoclonal antibodies, what we worry about is it washes out of your system and then you get it again, and then you're more likely to develop antibodies to it. So your body then basically is rejecting it and it no longer will be effective. So we worry about all those things, particularly for the biologics. And at present, we're, we're not recommending that anyone change their dose or alter anything. The other medications that we're a little bit more concerned about that may have a little bit more risk and we have to be a little bit more cautious with are really azathioprine or 6-MP, also goes by the name of Imuran um, or Purinethol, and also uh, Zeljans or Tofacitinib. Um, we worry about those uh, because they're, they really uh, impair the body's uh, ability a little bit more to handle viruses. Now still, people are not recommending to discontinue. I would say in a very select group of patients, we're reducing the dose. Uh, people who have been stable for a very prolonged period of time, and the likelihood of, of discontinuing uh, or cutting back on the dose probably is not going to have a problem. And that's assuming that we're going to get through this in uh, six to 12 weeks. Uh, and that's sort of currently what we're hoping is going to be the, the outside limits of what we need to go through. We would very much want to avoid steroids. When we look at all these various things we use, what we worry about most are really uh, steroids. Uh, so we want to limit their use and try to come down on the dose. Uh, and that's what we worry about most in terms of a broader immune suppressant. Even though we often are more familiar with prednisone and feel less fearful of it, it really should be something we try to uh, avoid as best we can or come down on the dose. Not everybody can. You might be in the midst of a bad flare and you might need that. And if so, then being all the more cautious to try to avoid that. As Gideon said, we're really shifting right now to a, a model of care, which is all virtual. Uh, today I had clinic. Um, I had 25 phone calls or video visits, uh, but was not face-to-face -face with anybody. Um, so 
it's a very different kind of feel. Uh, it means we're putting off many things, things like colonoscopies, uh, even blood tests. Some people we need to get blood tests on, but if we can defer, we do. Uh, colonoscopies and other procedures are very much seen, unless they're emergent, are semi-elective and we're deferring them as much as we can uh, for the time being. Um, and we really want people again to stay away from uh, the office, from the hospitals, and this uh, social or personal distancing is critical. Um, I think we should realize also that this is an opportunity. I don't want to be a Pollyanna and say, this is wonderful, it's not, it's a terrible time. But I think it's a good time to think, to spend time with family, to sort of weed out some of the craziness in the day-to-day -day life that we live in, uh, and, and an opportunity possibly to read about PSC or IBD. And there are some research opportunities that I think are gonna be are more remote, uh, and such as, as some studies we're doing uh, with PSC partners that we can uh, tell you uh, more about later. Um, I do think it, one of the things that is remarkable about this is it tells us that we're all connected. Uh, people talk about the butterfly effect and that a, uh, you know, the, the effect of a butterfly across the world will have an effect here. Well, who would have thought that a cough, somebody coughing in China is going to have an effect across the world and affect us also profoundly? It's not the kind of connection we really want, but there are other types of connections that really do help, such as this meeting and this conference tonight. So um, I will pause there. I thank you all for being part of this and for organizing this. And I'll turn things back to Ricky. Thank you so much. Um, you answer, already answered a lot of the questions that were sent in before now. Thank you. We all have questions about our IBD drugs. So I think you did that so thoroughly. Thank you. It was great. Um, so our third speaker is Dr. Jerome Schoferman, a retired internist with a 30-year practice in pain medicine. Dr. Schoferman is primarily interested in psychological responses to chronic illness, mostly liver diseases. Dr. Schoferman has PSC and he was transplanted in 2014. So he has the double perspective of both patient and physician. For several years, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Schoferman has been a highly respected speaker at our annual patient caregiver conferences. Dr. Schoferman. Thank you, Ricky, and I too, I am very grateful to be here and welcome the opportunity. Uh, this type of, the, the psychology of this um, COVID-19 illness is very different from psychology in a lot of other illnesses. Uh, this has been called epidemic psychology and it's different from the ordinary psychology uh, of, of, of an individual person's having a chronic illness because epidemic psychology is associated with the fear, fear of the unknown, panic about the rapid spread, suspicion about what could really be going on, and even some stigma uh, regarding some of the people who might be carriers. So I just would like to give you some of my perspectives on this epidemic psychology. Um, First of all, I think it's important to get away from some of the news and know who to listen to and who to not listen to, because there's so much confusion in the news all over. My perspective is we should be listening to people like Dr. Fauci, who is on TV just about every day, the World Health Organization, the CDC, and sometimes scientific articles that are re reprinted perhaps in uh, the newspapers. The New York Times has done a very good job at that. And equally important is who we shouldn't listen to. Uh, I think we should try to avoid listening to the polarized news outlets um, without taking a political position. The things that have been said by uh, Fox News with spreading a lot of disinformation has been harmful to trying to um, flatten the curve, as they say, for this epidemic. Uh, I would uh, not listen to a lot of the politicians that are spreading news, a lot of which has been false and potentially uh, dangerous. So I would like to reiterate a, a 
one or two things. Uh, where I live, we are uh, sheltered at home in uh, California, just north of San Francisco. And in some ways it has been enjoyable, but sheltering at home, it, I think it's a very important thing that we can do. And what we've learned from China, uh, that extreme sheltering has really made a difference. And I think it was yesterday was the first day they had no new uh, illnesses. So I'm a big fan of sheltering at home. A second thing I learned from Dr. Fauci is when he said, if you think you're doing enough, you're not doing enough. If you think you might be doing too much, you're probably doing the right amount. So that's not to spread a fear of uh, not of doing too much, but trying to keep it realistic. You have, we have to take major uh, and make major changes in our life. So I would just like to, my perspective on this now is that there are sort of four types of people and how they respond to this. The first type is the people that are in total denial. They're sort of the people who say, I won't get it. It's them, it's not me. These are the people we still see in the news congregating in large groups, having dance parties. And as Ricky said earlier, there are so many states that still have, have offered no good advice locally. So the, the denial group. The second group, what I'm calling the thinking types, sort of like I am. I'm pretty much data-driven, chart-driven. I, I take this very seriously and I take the steps because I'm a thinking person. The third group are sort of more feeling type and Jung described it that way as well. And when you combine type two, the thinking and the feeling type, you have people who become more compassionate and they sort of understand the threat intellectually and they have an emotional response. So that's the third type. The fourth type is sort of people who have severe anxiety. They sort of almost panic. And then when they panic, they can be in either immobilized by their anxiety or the other uh, end of that spectrum would be people who just have to do everything they possibly can, sort of hyper, hyper vigilant people. So those four types, if we can recognize uh, as an individual who we are and what type uh, we fit into, and these are of course just generalities, then perhaps we can uh, get focus our attention and see how being one type versus the other might serve us uh, well or might do us a disservice. So I think it's important to look at ourselves and see what type uh, of person we are. And then once we've sort of taken sort of a, a grasp of who we are and how we want to respond, there are actions we can take psychologically to care for ourselves and by caring for ourselves, we're also, as we just heard, reaching out to the greater uh, community at large, our family and friends, and more so the community around us. We're giving back, in a sense, to uh, people around us and helping them. One of the problems that we have is in this uh, social isolating, We people who are usually a uh, social animal, so to speak, and many of us are, have to find other ways to socialize. And there have been some suggestions, uh, but some of them are what we're doing right now. Zoom uh, talking, what people are calling video hangouts. I keep looking away a little because I took some notes ahead of time. So video hangouts, Zoom, even um, Skype, uh, FaceTime, WhatsApp, using those to, uh, in one-on-one -on -one or larger groups, uh, we have a book group um, that we're gonna try to do uh, on Zoom, a group that we usually get together. Um, another self-care technique that's important is exercise. Even in those of us who are sheltered at home need to get out and do some exercise. It's perfectly safe to go for a walk, even a bicycle ride, uh, usually by al usually alone, but also we can do it with someone else. If the person is uh, someone you live with, maybe the six feet 
is not so critical, but if it's not someone who you live with, then we have to observe that physical uh, distancing. Things like when you're at home and going a little stir crazy, starting to maintain a schedule, sort of something like you might do if in, in your usual day of life. Schedule what you're gonna do in the morning, what you're gonna do in the afternoon. If you have children home from school, uh, what, what activities you're gonna do with them in the evenings, maybe things like board games. Um, things that we put off all the time, cleaning a room, a house, um, the study that I'm in is a mess and we're just starting to clean that. Um, finding something that we can do for personal uh, relaxation, maybe even spirituality, meditation, or practicing some sort of uh, even faith-based uh, way to, to calm ourselves and reassess that we are part of the larger community. We all know about the safety features that we have to do. Soap, soap is better than sanitizers. Soap uh, for 20 seconds, good careful hand wash is doing something for ourselves. And when we do things for ourselves, we're actually helping to allay some of the anxiety we might have. Um, so there, these are some of the things that we can do to help ourselves uh, avoiding the confusion, maybe not looking at the news all day long, knowing who to listen to and who to ignore, uh, trying to see that we are people that will get over this at some point in the hopefully not so distant future. And maybe it's possible we will uh, learn something about our own personal self that we can use uh, going on in the future. So I think that's enough to talk about the psychology. And of course, uh, I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that come up. So thank you. Thank you for clearly delineating the psychological and emotional effects of dealing with coronavirus. And I know that isolation is driving us all crazy. And in my family, we started having uh, virtual family dinners and our 12 year old granddaughter introduced us all to what is it called house party sort of like Zoom, and um, so we just had a lot of laughs and all eating together, sharing our food, and it, it, we just all have to be creative. So thank you to all three of you. So uh, we will start the Q&A. Mary, do you want to start the first question from our community? Sure. Thank you, Ricky. Um, before we get started, I'd like to give some instructions for the people attending if they'd like to submit questions. So first of all, if you are having any technical difficulty, please try to use the chat function and uh, we'll try to sort the problem out. You should find the chat icon on the bottom of your screen. Um, now, if you'd like to submit a question, please do use the Q&A box to submit your question. Again, it's at the bottom of your screen. You should see a Q&A icon. Uh, you may need to move your mouse to move your pointer to hover over the bottom of the Zoom window to see the, the icon. Um, you may submit your questions anonymously or not. Regardless, only you, the panelists, and the question moderators, Rachel Gomel and Joanne Hatchett will see your question. Uh, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, when you submit a question, please put the name of who you are addressing the question to at the beginning of your question. Please keep your questions general. We do not have time for specific questions about an individual situation. Uh, your doctor is the best person for that. And finally, as we have mentioned, the webinar will be recorded and if all goes as planned, um, we will share as soon as possible. So yes, so I will start with a question for um, Dr. Hirschfield. Um, so this question was submitted earlier. Can you explain if those with PSC or post-transplant might have any different symptoms than fever, cough, or shortness of breath? Um, what, would, what would be a red alert for when a PSCer should call their doctor? So, so that's a very good question. So, so fundamentally, I, I don't think so from a pure corona perspective, COVID perspective. I think Josh did touch upon one of the challenges is that we are starting to see a little bit more um, GI symptoms. And so a patient may be not clear whether they, they, their IBD is there or whether they've, they've developed a, a viral illness. But largely speaking, I think um, our advice is gonna be consistent with uh, CDC, um, uh, Health Canada, um, et cetera that we're looking to see um, that uh, fever, cough, uh, sore throat, uh, uh, and myalgias are the predominant symptoms. 
I think um, we're recommending that if a patient gets those symptoms, they're, they're in contact either with their family doctor or with the public health line. Um, they can, of course, contact their specialist as well. We are suggesting that largely you're probably not going to actually need to see a doctor. You may want to talk to somebody, a nurse or a doctor, but largely for most patients, this will be treated as if they have a viral illness, a viral respiratory illness, and they will self-medicate at home. They'll use Tylenol. Um, I think most of our patients avoid ibuprofen anyway, and that there's a possibility that that would be sensible to continue avoiding ibuprofen. And I think that the red flag symptoms really are um, uh, breathlessness. I think that's really a, a big concern. Um, I think that um, weakness and confusion, you know, real, real confusion would, would be a concern. Obviously, collapse would be a co concern. <clears throat> um, and um, I'm sure if someone had absolutely unremitting fever despite Tylenol, then it's likely that they're going to seek some, some help. But actually, most of our patients should be sensible. They're already doing all the social distancing. And all of our patients, I think, have experienced most of these illnesses before and know what to do. And with a little bit of help from you know, their local providers and the trusted websites, I think we'll probably self-manage quite a large part of this. Now, clearly, for the patients who are post-transplant, there's going to be more anxiety. Um, they are likely to be on tacrolimus. Um, but again, I think they're used to this, this level of uncertainty. One of the things that is actually quite interesting and maybe reassuring is that actually one of the biggest challenges for patients who get severe COVID viral pneumonia is actually a massive inflammatory response. And some of the treatments that have been used successfully in China are actually anti-inflammatories. So it may be that we learn that some of our patients who are on immunosuppressants are actually slightly protected. We don't know that yet. It's speculation. We're not expecting people not to be um, cautious. But it is very interesting that some of the early reports that have come out of China of successful treatments for patients with very severe viral pneumonia have in fact been treatments against the immune system. Um, so uh, again, there, is, there are some um, uh, glimmers of hope that in fact, not everyone who's immunocompromised will actually necessarily be at, at greater risk. It, it's much more complicated than we think. Okay. All right. The next question is for Dr. Korzenek. It's actually two questions together. Um, one is, is it safe to get takeout food or to eat at a restaurant if they're still open? If I sit far from others, I guess for most of us, it's takeout food or delivery. And also, is it safe to buy fruit and vegetables from a farmer's market or a fruit stand? Your opinions on that? Yeah, so those are really important questions because the, the question is how, how much can we limit <clears throat> our interactions? My own advice would be uh, to avoid a restaurant. Uh, to avoid places that are you're going to be coming in, into contact with more people, whether it's directly or indirectly. And even though we think that the virus doesn't survive that long, there have been some newer reports out uh, that it may survive on metal and plastic and other things for a little bit longer than we would have thought previously. So I would certainly avoid a restaurant. Um, takeout food may be different and I don't I wouldn't say we have great information on that um, and uh, we don't know if somebody has the virus preparing the food how long is it going to survive I would say that if you're in a very high risk category I would tend to avoid it just because we don't know it may be excessive uh, but as Gideon was pointing out if, if you feel like you're doing too much you're probably doing the right thing um, in terms of uh, a farmer's market, uh, if it's food that you can carefully wash, um, if it's food that has a peel to it, uh, so if you could buy, if it's an orange and you can wash it uh, and then remove the peel cautiously, I think it's fine. Um, I think if it's something that you can't really do that or it's uh, people are advising against lettuce or things like that, that you're, you may have a harder time washing and feel secure to avoid it. Some of this, again, may fit into the category of being excessive. Uh, we don't do that for the flu, but we don't, and uh, this though is more contagious than the flu. So 
I, I would lean uh, towards being more cautious, uh, avoiding restaurants, uh, probably avoiding uh, takeout food, particularly if you're in the high-risk category, uh, farmer's market. You want to still continue to eat healthy food to the best you can, uh, but limiting it to things that you can feel securely you can wash. And can I just add, you know, as regards takeout, if you are going to do takeout, go to the place you've taken out before. Because, you know, now's not the time to try a new takeout, get food poisoning and you know, trigger your IBD. Um, so, you know, again, you can make sensible choices. And if you, you, you know, you don't have to, you know, just go to random places you've never used before. Uh, that's another sensible thing you can add into sort of to, to, to practice social distancing in the real world, but also be sensible. If I could add one other thing, uh, farmer's market now, I haven't been to one in quite a while, but um, there's a lot of crowds in farmer's markets in the past. And also when you go to a, people touch all different foods in the farmer's market before they pick the piece of the perfect uh, apple or peach or whatever it is. So um, I agree that things have to be washed and if possible peeled, but it's not just the farmers, it's also the people who are touching and sampling the uh, different foods. Okay, the next question is for Dr. Schoferman. P.S. Sears uh, can't sleep, and this is not helping me. This, uh, there's probably nothing that can help, but I thought I'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it depends what you've tried. Um, a lot of people do, there are a lot of opportunities for eating insomnia online with uh, different forms of meditation, different forms of sleep hygiene. Um, uh, but if, if one can't sleep well at night, a nap during the day is uh, very appropriate. But uh, I find that um, doing some meditation, not nothing formal, but when I go to sleep, doing relaxation, breathing exercises usually is something uh, that will help me go to sleep. Um, but it depends why a person can't sleep. If it's itching, that's a different situation than just the anxiety of uh, illness. But something at night um, rather than medication uh, is, and there are a lot, as I said, plenty of online sites that have calming meditations uh, to help you sleep, reading, listening to an audio book, uh, particularly one that's a little bit boring, things like that can help you sleep. Can I, can I just add something that I'm going to try myself, uh, Ricky, Mary, uh, turn your phone off um, <laughs> and, and turn your computer off. You know, I think uh, I've, I've certainly suffered from this in the last two weeks. It's reminiscent of 9-11, um, you know, and I'm going to start turning my phone off. Um, because I think that, that it doesn't help, um, you know, uh, and if you don't sleep, of course, it's much harder to cope the next day. Yes. We PSCers know that well. So, um, Dr. Hirschfeld, um, these are two questions. Uh, so, do we know how the liver is affected by COVID-19 and does it increase inflammation of the bile ducts in the colon? Okay, so, um, the answer is we don't know very much. Um, I think we've already touched upon there is some patients that get diarrhea. I'm not exactly, we don't necessarily know the mechanism of that. Um, we know that a certain percentage of patients who get severe COVID do have abnormal liver tests. Um, we know that there has been some evidence of the virus in, in the liver, but we don't think it's really damaging the liver per se, at least to my understanding. Um, I think when people are very sick, the liver does show its displeasure. It's a very common request for our opinion when we have patients on intensive care, don't have liver disease, we're very sick. We often get asked to go and see them because their liver tests are abnormal and we virtually never do anything. And it's nearly always just a marker of the fact that they were systemically sick. Do I think it directly affects the bile ducts? No. Um, will there be studies? No doubt someone will eventually show that the virus is there, but I don't think that necessarily means it's it's something that PSC should be particularly worried about. I think if a PSC does get COVID, one of the things that I would be recommending is to make sure they stay well hydrated, okay? Because in any of our patients with PSC and IBD, you know, if you become dehydrated, um, 
that never helps bile flow, that never helps their colon, okay? So really it's the supportive measures, to my mind, presently, that are more, more important. And to at least, and, and Josh can, can comment, you know, whilst there are some data coming out, that they've, they've not been data that has suggested that it's immediately something I have to do something about clinically. Yeah, I, I could, very much agree, yep. I would just say one thing, there are several uh, unproven remedies that have been uh, recommended, not without any substantial evidence, no evidence, I should say, and one of them is drinking water every 15 minutes, having a glass of water during the waking day. And I think some of those uh, quack cures posted online, you know, there are others drinking silver, uh, there's several other ones, but drinking water every 15 minutes is one of them, and I think we should avoid that particular uh, false treatment claim. Thank you. Sorry, and I, I should just add, were anyone to be unlucky enough to get COVID, there are some experimental treatments, and to my knowledge, having liver disease is not a reason why you would not receive those treatments. Um, you know, we don't know whether those treatments work yet, and your doctors wouldn't be giving them to you um, without consideration, but broadly speaking, um, uh, they're, they're largely going to be offered to everyone and individualized around all of the medicines that they're taking, rather than the mere fact that they've got PSC or IBD. Thank you. Okay, so the next question, um, I think, is for Dr. Korzenik, and there's a couple of questions along the lines of this, and it's not everybody is in an area where the government has taken any action. Um, and so the question is, should people with PSC and their family be more proactive about removing their children from school if the schools are still functioning um, and their own choices around social distancing? So I think it's a really important question and I certainly would. I think that the, the concern is not so much the hazard to the child because for the most part, we, even though I think young adults are a different category, I think uh, much meaning, uh, say, teenagers uh, and, and kids in their 20s. I think littler kids uh, can get it. They might have very mild flu kind of uh, illness or nothing at all, and then they're fine. The, the danger is, are they really the messengers or do they bring it home to family? And then that's the bigger concern. So I would hope that most of these communities are changing that pretty rapidly, but I would be proactive it's a challenge because then the child is missing out and then may not be particularly happy about that. And it's fine if it's a day or two or a week or two, but this may go on, as you know, for quite a while. But yes, I think it's important to try to uh, keep uh, your uh, house and your family as sealed off as possible. When I see these uh, kids down in Florida having spring break, it sort of saddens me because everyone else is working so hard. and if the rest of the population isn't doing the same, and this, this would pertain even to kids going to school, then this whole idea of flattening the curve and trying to bring down the risk won't happen. So I think that's very important uh, to do for, for your family uh, and to try to minimize the risk to any individual with PSC or IBD. Okay. And while we're talking about families, there are questions, uh, two questions for Dr. Schoferman that work together. Um, one is, how do I talk to my young children about COVID-19 and all the changes we're having to make as a family in our lives? And do you have any suggestions for helping me reduce my children's anxiety about all this? The, um, the, the, the first part of the question, how do I talk to my children? It depends on the age of the child and his or her level of understanding and maturity. I think the first thing is to, do, to assure the child that um, children, uh, as we just heard, often or all, most always have mild illnesses if they get it at all. And um, reassuring the child that they're not gonna die from this, uh, they probably won't even get sick. And secondarily, reassuring the child that their parents aren't necessarily gonna get sick or die from this. If the child is at school and hearing all these rumors, uh, bringing those rumors home, uh, asking the child what they've heard, if they're still in school, just trying to talk frankly and honestly, but trying to judge what level of understanding uh, a child might have. But honesty 
is really important, but of course, uh, tempering it to the maturity and the age of the um, of that particular child. I'm sorry, I forgot the other half of the question. Okay, the other half was, um, well, you've kind of done it. Uh, do you have any suggestions for helping reduce the children's anxiety? You went through it. I think you've covered it. Thank you. So our time is running um, quickly here. Um, I had a, a different question I was going to ask each of you as your last one, but you've actually already covered it, each of you. So um, if each of you would just, if there's something you would like to say to sort of end this, any extra advice or repeat something or something we haven't talked about? I'd just like to add uh, sort of two bits of information that I learned recently or has been suggested. There's a good colleague, a friend who's a very smart epidemiologist who's doing some modeling in this area. And he's had two things, one of which is a little disconcerting and one which is very reassuring. The disconcerting thing is he feels, and other people have pointed this out, is that the warmer weather won't necessarily, won't likely have a big impact. I think it's really the social distancing and other things. When, when he's looked at where the virus has been spreading and what the temperatures are, uh, it hasn't had a big impact. It's really the other measures that, that you've heard about that make a big impact. That's not, the, that's not great news because it might last a little bit longer. The good news though is several things. One is that he feels that uh, looking at data and special techniques he's developed to uh, look not just at the people who had blood tests or uh, uh, testing done, swabs and other things because those are people at higher risk. He thinks that the risk of mortality uh, is dramatically lower than what we've thought. It originally came out, it was 3.4% and then 2.5% and then 1% then 0.7%. He thinks it may be even lower than that. Uh, the FDA today did approve in quotes its first medication for COVID. I would say it's, it's on an embarrassingly small amount of data, just 30 patients. It's an existing medication, uh, which I'm sure will be in very short supply even though the pharmaceutical industry is ramping up to try to get much more. Uh, so it's promising, and there are about 40 or 50 other compounds that are in development, and as Gideon said, a vaccine, a number of vaccines are, are in the works. So this isn't with us forever. Uh, we have rapidly made progress as a community, uh, but there are definitely tough times up ahead. And so we are all here together for each other, and we will hopefully uh, bring this to a close uh, in the not too distant future. I, I would just say, look, as everyone protects themselves, um, it's really important um, uh, that you think about how you can protect the system. Because if we don't all protect the system, the system won't be there to protect you. So the system can protect us all. It does have the capacity, the resource, the know-how, the doctors, the nurses. And, you know, I'll be the first to apologize for the disruption to our elective services. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's different for us to be using telehealth and telephone calls. Um, Josh will be having discussions with his infusion centers about the timing of infusions, the rebookings of endoscopies. Um, but we're doing this because we really do believe that that's the best way to, to by protecting the system, then the system will be there um, uh, for us. The second thing I would say, and it really sort of speaks to something Jerome said, Look, let's be blunt, we're all anxious about this. Um, and that goes from the hospital chief executive uh, <laughs> down to the, the, the cleaner, down to every single patient. So, you know, um, now's a good time just to be nice to each other. Um, people are going to be anxious. They, people, people will have good days and bad days um, because, it, because it, that there's a lot of un uncertainty. But also, I think... Um, to then echo exactly what Josh said, you know, the amount of effort that's going into how to manage this both, both with sort of the social distancing and then the science and the treatment is phenomenal. And I've no doubt that we can, we can see ourselves out at the other end. I, I would just like to say a few, th one thing I would like to suggest for people who are alone uh, is we can reach out to people around us, especially elderly that are homebound uh, by phone, by any means possible without direct contact to sort of give back to others around us. And what I'm trying to do and I think might be useful is to learn something new. 
If we're uh, home sheltered, it's another opportunity. I um, am planning to take out the ukulele that I haven't uh, taken out for about four or five years and see if I can uh, remember anything. So learning something new, if this is an opportunity to, to do some things that we've put off. And again, we've all said this, but sheltering at home as much as possible is the best thing we can do for ourselves, our family, and for the wider community around us. And thank you all for all that useful information. Uh, it was a very good webinar. Great, this has been a wonderful educational opportunity for all of us. And I can't thank our speakers enough. Let's give them a virtual hand of applause wherever you are, even though we can't see you. Um, I hope that you learn more about uh, coronavirus and what precautions to take as we continue our journey in our current world that has turned absolutely upside down. Please follow the wise advice of our physicians, practice strict social distancing, and stay in touch with your friends at PSC Partners. It's really important. We're starting to plan a series of webinars with some of the speakers from our April conference that we sadly had to cancel. If you're not on our mailing list, please go to our website at pscpartners.org and join the mailing list or our social media groups to keep updated on our activities. In order to try to keep our community updated on the latest information about PSC IBD and how it relates to coronavirus, we're putting a coronavirus page on our website. Feel free to reference it from time to time. As Mary said, we will publicize the recording as soon as it is available. And if you have time on your hands these days, spend some time on our website watching the videos from past conferences or learning some of the information we have on our site. And most importantly, if you have not joined our patient registry, this is a great time to do that. We're a tight community working together in the fight, whatever it takes. Thank you for joining us today. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much for all of this wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Good night. Good night. Good night.